A very good morning to one and all present. I am Sanjay from the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Sri Balaji Dental College to present a topic on Maxillary Sinus. It gives me immense pleasure to present in front of you the seminar titled Maxillary Sinus. Now we look into the synopsis. The introduction, functions of sinus, development of maxillary sinus, anatomy, drainage of sinus, lining of epithelium, radiologic assessment, which is also followed by the classification of maxillary sinusitis, diagnostic criteria, acute maxillary sinusitis, chronic maxillary sinusitis, complications, acute oroantral fistula, management of the oroantral fistula, followed by the chronic oroantral fistula and the calder look procedure and the recent advances in the treatment of the maxillary sinusitis. Now we look into the introduction. The paranasal sinuses are the large air filled cavities are called as the accessory nasal sinus because they are lined with the mucous membrane which is continuous with the nasal cavity. These sinuses are divided into four groups according to the bones that contain them. They are maxillary sinus, frontal sinus, ethmoidal sinus, spinal sinus. The maxillary sinus are two in number, the frontal sinus are two in number which present the cranial bones and maxillary also forms the facial bones. There are many ethmoidal sinuses which may present the cranial bone and the spinal sinus. Now we look into the functions of the paranasal sinuses, humidification and the warming of the inspired air, regulation of the intranasal pressure, increasing surface area for olfaction as well as the smell, lightening the skull, resonance, absorbing the shock, contribution to the facial growth. Now we look into the development of the paranasal sinuses. Paranasal sinus appear as a diverticula from the nasal cavity. Maxillary sinus and the spinal sinus begins to develop before birth. The frontal sinus and ethmoidal sinus develop after birth. Enlargement of the paranasal sinuses is associated with overall enlargement of the facial skeleton. Now we look into the anatomy. The maxillary sinus is the largest of the paranasal sinus, which is pyramidal in shape, located within the body of the maxillary bone. Its apex is directed laterally that is formed by zygomatic process. Base is formed by the lateral wall of the nose. The alveolar process forms the floor. Many projections are seen in floor of the antrum corresponding to the roots of the first and second molar teeth. Its base has an aperture communicating with the nasal cavity. It communicates with the middle meters of the nose by two small apertures. In fresh state, one small opening exists near upper part of the cavity and other close by the mucous membrane. The posterior wall contains allular canal transmitting the posterior superior allular nerves and vessels to the molar teeth. Now look into the drainage of the sinus. The anterior superior part of the base has an opening which communicates the lower part of the higher to similar nerves. Otherwise known as the bulla ethmoid nerves. Bordered inferiorly by the sharp ancillary process of the ethmoid bone and leads into the curved channel called as the infundibulum. Now we look into the lining of the epithelium. It is lined by the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. In acute inflammation, increase in neutrophils is seen and in chronic sinusitis, increase in lymphocytes and plasma cells are found. In prolonged chronicity, the cilia might be lost and the lining cells show dysplastic changes. Dysplastic changes means disordered epithelial arrangement. Now look at the size of the sinus. The size of the sinus varies in different skulls and even on two sides of the same skull. The adult capacity varies from 9.5 to 20 cc and the average is about 14.75 cc. The vertical height is opposite to first molar tooth which measures 3.75 cm. The transverse breadth is 2.5 cm. Anterior posterior depth is 3 cm. Arterial supply by facial, infraorbital and greater parietal vessels. Venous drainage by facial and pterygoid plexus of veins. Nerve supply is by the infraorbital, anterior, middle and posterior superior alveolar nerves. Lymphatic drainage by submandibular and upper deep cervical nodes. Now we look at the radiologic assessment. It is usually done with all other paranasal sinuses. The standard radiographs taken for the assessment of the vaccine sinus are intraoral and extraoral classified. Intraoral radiographs like occlusal, lateral and periapical views. Extraoral radiographs like water's view 
frontal view, lateral view, subventral vertex, OPG, and the posterior anterior view. Others like computer tomography and magnetic resonance imaging are also used. This is the Caldock sinus projection. To clear the ridges, the Caldock view can be taken. And you can see the subventral vertex view, reverse tons view, and the standard radiograph. This is the Caldock view. The reverse tons view shows the condylar heads and necks. The original tons view was designed to show the occipital region, but also shows the condyles. However, since all skull views in dentistry are taken conventionally in the posterior direction, the reverse tons view is used. Maxillary sinusitis. Maxillary sinusitis is defined as an inflammatory response involving the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinus. Now we look under the classification of maxillary sinusitis according to the duration and presence or absence of the polyps or etiology. According to the duration, it is classified as acute, which lasts for 7 days to 6 4 weeks, subacute followed by the 4 weeks to 12 weeks, chronic greater than 12 weeks, and recurrent acute 4 episodes per year. Based upon the presence of the absence of the etiology, it is classified as bacterial, fungal, viral, mycobacteria, and parasite. The diagnostic criteria, the signs and symptoms is classified as major and minor. Major symptoms are the facial pain or pressure, facial congestion, nasal obstruction, hyposmia or anosmia, fever, poor lens of the nasal examination. Minor, headache, fever, dental pain, cough, ear pain, pressure or fullness. Acute maxillary sinusitis. Now we can differentiate between the normal healthy sinus and acute sinusitis, which is characterized by the inflammation of the maxillary sinus region, which is characterized by the accumulation of the mucus or pus in the sinus. The causative agents for the maxillary sinusitis are Haemophilus influenza, Moraxella catralis, Streptococcus pyogenes, Staphylococcus aureus. The clinical features of the ac acute maxillary sinusitis are the ETRG is mainly from dental infections by means of the periapical infection or dental laxus or oroantral fistula, viral rhinitis followed by the bacterial infection, diving and swimming, trauma, the fractures and the penetrating injuries. Clinical features, constitutional symptoms, headache, pain, tenderness, redness and edema of cheek, nasal discharge, post nasal discharge. Now, when you look into the treatment of the acute maxillary sinus and the clinical features, headache and severe pain increase by bending of the increase by bending the head downwards, pain and tenderness in the upper teeth, unilateral fatigue, nasal discharge, nasal obstruction with unpleasant smell. General symptoms of the toxemia such as fever, malaise, and dizziness is seen. The treatment for this antibiotics is prescribed from five to seven days. Decongestions, nasal decongestions to shrink the mucus lining and help the drainage. Analgesics to relieve the pain. In an oroantral fistula, if present, the daily irrigation of the sinus region with warm normal saline is done. Removal of the underlying cause like the oroantral fistula. Surgical closure of the oroantral fistula. Now we look at the chronic sinusitis. When we compare between the acute sinusitis and the chronic sinusitis, Chronic sinusitis is nothing but the acute exer is a chronic it is an acute exacerbation of the when the acute sinusitis prolongs for a long time it gets progress to the chronic sinusitis or the acute sinusitis is in the way that stimulate that provokes to the formation of the chronic sinusitis. Etiology it may be due to the persistence of the external aggravating factors such as nasal polyposis, septal deviation, allergic rhinitis and even chronic marginal periodontitis. Chronic sinusitis is often associated with the allergic rhinitis, asthma, cystic fibrosis and dental infection. A dental cause accounts for 40% of cases of chronic maxillary sinusitis. The signs and symptoms of the chronic sinusitis, the nasal congestion or obstruction, loss or decrease of sense of smell and taste, headache, snoring, sleep apnea, phonations problems, aridosis, hoarseness, your pressure, vertigo, frontal ethmoid or maxillary sinus pressure, 
post nasal drip throat clearing hoarseness so throat cough worsening of the asthma symptoms fever general malaise now we're going to the clinical features of the chronic mass sinusitis continuous dull pain and intermittent headache periodic or persistent unilateral nasal discharge fetid breath posterior nasal discharge trans inhalation reveals opacity of the affected site X-ray shows the opacity of the sinus with marked thickening of the line. The treatment for this are extraction of the infected tooth, repair of the oroenteral communications. The thickening line should be removed through caudal loop operation. Oroenteral fistula. The oroenteral fistula is defined as an abnormal pathological communication between the oral cavity and the maxillary sinus. Depending on its location, it may be classified into alveolar sinusal, parietal sinusal. And vestibular sinusal. The oroenteral fistula is characterized by the formation of the epithelialized tract between maxillary sinus and oral cavity. When chronic oroenteral fistula defects are wider than 5 mm and persist for more than 3 weeks, a secondary surgical intervention is required. It can be accomplished by the presence of buccal flap and palatal flap. The test to detect oroenteral communication. There are various tests to detect the oroenteral communication and few are some. Observe the bubbling of the blood from the post extraction alveolus when the patient tries to exhale gently through their nose while nostrils are pinched. If patient exhales through their nose with great pressure, this causing oroenteral communication may occur even though communication may not have occurred initially. Fluid comes out of the nose while rinsing post extraction. Fogging of the mouth mirror when placed directly on the extraction site as patient exhales through his nose. Radiograph is usually used to confirm and also detect the extent of the defect. Diagnosis There are various methods to diagnose the oroandral communication. History Patients complain when the patient complains of the difficulty while breathing or discharge from the nose while in rest. While inspecting, we can find the communication of the fistula is visualized. Radiographic examination by means of radio opaque probe or gutta perka sticks, air bubbles, fluid test, valsalva test, instrumentation by means of the blunt probe. Closure of the or how to close the oroenteral communication. Now, till now we have discussed about the anatomy, anatomy, the maxillary sinusitis, and uh, the occurrence of the oro and occurrence of the oroenteral communication. Now we are going to discuss in detail about the closure of the oroenteral communication depending on the size. The oroenteral communication, if the size is less than 2 mm, it may it, it closes spontaneously. If it is 2 to 6 mm, suturing over the site is recommended and sinus precautions. If it is greater than 6 mm, it is recommended to close with the flap. Local tissue advancement, palatal rotation, buccal BFP, buccal fat, buccal fat pedicle. In the next slide, we'll, in next part, we will discuss in detail about the management of the oroantral fistula. Thank you.